Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Leandro, and uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, before I start the talk, just a uh, bit of information about myself. Uh, I've been programming for, for a while, and although I only remember doing some usable stuff since I began contributing to open source software. Uh, I used to do web development from early 2000s to about 2004, but moved on to embedded systems and uh, uh, systems programming and haven't looked back. Well, kind of, because the project I'll be talking about today is somewhat related to web development. Uh, I'm a mechatronics technician and have a bachelor's degree in computer engineering. And uh, I'm also uh, working as a full-time uh, software engineer since 2010. Uh, my day job is at, at uh, Intel OTC, uh, which is Open Source Technology Center, where I'm currently working on uh, with drones and other similar cool stuff. Uh, the rocket picture is not part of that job, unfortunately. Uh, it's just a prop from the Tintin comic series in the Comic uh, Strip Museum in, in Brussels. So I'd like to start the presentation by let you, letting you all down, because this is a cold hard truth. Uh, web servers are really, really boring piece of software. Uh, it's quite hard, actually, to present them uh, in an entertaining and informative way. They're pretty much like this picture. Um, sure, the, the, um, there's a beautiful uh, sky and equally beautiful blue water, but there's nothing much else in the picture. Uh, and web server on the surface are unlike this. So this is a simple web server. Uh, you create a TCP socket, bind it to a network interface and port. Uh, you tell the operating system uh, to listen for connections on that socket, uh, and then create a loop that uh, will accept connection, pass requests, and send a response and repeat that over and over again, and what well, we have a web server. But uh, some will say that beauty is the details, and things begin to change when you start diving um, beautiful, um, exquisite things. Um, sometimes not so exquisite, uh, but uh, you get the point, right? So welcome to Deep Sea Creatures 101, uh, where I show you how my, web, my toy web server works below the surface. Uh, I could talk all this day and be that guy, but I only have about half an hour, so uh, you'll be all lucky because I'll be brief. Um, feel f free to ask questions after the session, though. So uh, I'll talk about these topics today. Uh, brief introduction, uh, how clients are scheduled, how coroutines are used as green threads, how requests are passed, the templating engine, and the cache subsystem. So um, that's L1 in a nutshell. It's a weekend project I've been working on for the past four years. It's highly experimental, although rock solid. I've been hosting my blog with it. Uh, it scales well and has pretty decent performance. It's also free and open source. And it initially only worked in Linux, but uh, it has been, been since supported to FreeBSD and Mac. And maybe it will work on other BSDs as well. Uh, it can serve both dynamic and uh, static content. and Dynamic content can be generated through handlers within either C or Lua. And I wasn't really kidding when I showed the previous slide with some code in it. Uh, that in fact, that's pretty much uh, like L1 started. Uh, it doesn't take too much to know that uh, uh, it won't work that well. Uh, so early on, I've made the decision to change it to look pretty much like this. So one thread accepts connections, and one thread pCPU uh, will juggle the clients. So here's the main thread, uh, the one that accepts clients. Um, some of the error handler have been uh, omitted for brevity, but the, the idea isn't much different from that initial implementation. Uh, there are two notable differences. So accept four is used to set flags in the client sockets, notably non-blocking I.O. and close in an exec, uh, without a need to, for an additional uh, round trip to the kernel. Uh, and a call to private function that schedules the client. Uh, to one of those uh, worker threads. Uh, of note, uh, if I seek int signal, or in other words, if control C is pressed, uh, the signal handler will shut down the main socket, and uh, the accept for function will fail uh, with a bad follow script error. Uh, that's how well one knows how to shut itself down, and it's a lot easier than the self-pipe trick uh, that's usually used in these situations. Um, I'll get back to scheduling in a bit, but I need to open a parenthesis first. So dynamic memory allocation from the heap can be quite expensive, so L1 pre-allocates a bunch of memory beforehand. 
Uh, one of the pre-allocated things is an array of a struct holding information for the client connection. And this array is indexed by the file descriptor. Uh, so it's efficient to both find uh, an element given the file descriptor and find the file descriptor given uh, an element. Uh, and has as many elements as there can be file descriptors in the L1 process. This is shared between all threads without any kind of locks. Uh, the comment hints that this structure being 32 bytes long is somehow important. Uh, but why? So, in order to understand why, uh, let's consider this diagram of a naive multi core CPU architecture. Specifically, it's cache hierarchy. Uh, of course, uh, atop the L2, uh, there's a memory. And in this diagram, uh, the L2 cache is shown between two cores. Uh, but things complicate a little bit more if we enable simultaneous multi-threading, commonly known as hyper-threading on Intel CPUs. Um, some of the elements making up a core are duplicated and enabling higher uh, computer performance uh, at the penalty of sharing the fastest cache level. And where there's sharing, there is locking. So, and this is a pattern uh, where uh, uh, leads to what is known as false sharing. Uh, it's essentially an implicit lock that gets uh, use it whenever two cores try to write the same cache line. Here we have a simple structure with two integers and an array for this structure. Um, since cache memory is expensive, uh, it's organized in what is called the line, and it's commonly a 64 byte long uh, on today's processors. And the drawing is not for scale. So whenever uh, two cores try to write to any of the that array's elements, uh, one of them, uh, one of the cores will have to wait until the, the write operation is complete. Uh, while this maintains things for hint, uh, this negatively impacts the performance. Now, there are ways to solve this problem, and I'm not aware of any that are not platform specific. Uh, in, in this case, uh, we are assuming that each cache line holds 64 bytes, and we're creating a padding to uh, allow each core to operate independently without any explicit locks. So far, so good. However, uh, this uh, wastes a lot of memory. Uh, sometimes you can afford that. Sometimes you can do something about it. So uh, going back to the, that structure uh, uh, shown earlier, uh, this is why uh, the connection structure is exactly 32 bytes long. So two of them can fit on a single cache line. Um, so closing the parentheses, uh, uh, so let's talk about how connections are scheduled. So here's how the schedule client uh, function works. So you can see the formula to pick uh, which array uh, thread to schedule a connection. Uh, uh, um, that, that depends on the platform. So only the x86-64 uh, uh, case knows about false sharing. And all the platforms will use a round-robin approach. That's because the size of the connection structure will be different, and I'd have to know about how, how the cache layout and that platforms work. Uh, the important thing, however, is regardless of which thread is given in a connection, that thread will handle the, the, the connection until uh, it's closed for any reason. So uh, moving on to the more interesting stuff, the threads that do the grunt work. So um, creating kernel-level threads has some associated uh, costs that not scale that well. And that's a shame, because synchronous APIs are a lot easier to use than asynchronous APIs with lots of callback functions. And due to the lack of polish and, and, and POSIX uh, asynchronous I.O. on Linux, the best, uh, next best thing is the readiness model, where um, a call such as select or their uh, uh, modern counterparts can be used to select uh, to query which file descriptors are ready to be read from or written to. Um, coupling that with non-blocking I.O., uh, this ends up being pretty similar to what one would expect from a completion model, where you, you, you're notified uh, when something is, is ready to be used. Uh, callbacks functions are still a problem, though. Uh, here's an example uh, of a pretty decent uh, kitchen sink library. Uh, it's called Glib. Uh, so to perform some asynchronous I.O., we'll, we'll call this function and uh, we'll pass a callback function. Uh, this function is called whenever something happens, like uh, the file has been successfully read or there was an error. 
So, um, but if using callback functions on languages that uh, allow for anonymous functions are, uh, can be quite cumbersome, you can imagine that in C, where you don't have that. Uh, so if various asynchronous operations are to be performed in a row, uh, error recovery becomes difficult and error prone. Not mentioning memory ownership, leaks, and, and deadlocks. So in L1, I decided to avoid this callback hell by using coroutines. Uh, the coroutine package has been written uh, for L1 after I poked it around a bit uh, with just about every coroutine library I could find. Um, each connection has an associated coroutine, and there is a loop uh, in each worker thread that pulls the system for the default descriptor readiness. Uh, coroutines are resumed, execution takes place where, where they uh, yielded the previous time. And this has some advantages and some disadvantages when we compare that to threads. So the advantages include uh, faster uh, context switching. For instance, on x86, both 32 and 64 bit, there are short routines written in assembly uh, that are used to swap the context. Uh, the save and restore only the minimum registers uh, required by the System 5 ABI used by Linux and the BSDs. And there are some wrapper functions uh, uh, to, for open, read, and send file system calls. And if they return a recoverable error, uh, the coroutine yields to the main loop, uh, so they can be tried again. And uh, on, on recoverable error, the coroutine can be aborted. Uh, so, but then, then there is the error uh, uh, um, recovery uh, strategy. So they have all the, it's called the deferred callback. So callbacks aren't really good for thing for IO in general, in my opinion, but ne neither is resource cleanup. So um, being inspired by Golang's deferred statements, uh, um, coroutines L1 has deferred callbacks. So the wrapper functions they regist register callbacks to close and open, open files, free allocate the memory, uh, the reference ca uh, reference counted stuff, you know, and these are called whenever the coroutine end and uh, regardless of in, in, in motives. Um, it's not 100% though, uh, perfect, uh, but for instance, if blocking IO is used, uh, all coroutines that in that thread will, will, will be blocked, and it's very, very easy to corrupt memory and get into an undebuggable mess. So no debuggers will be able to help you here much. Um, so uh, here's some sample showing how the coroutine API is presented to the user. In this completely over-engineered example, a naive uh, equivalent to Python's X-range generator is shown. So here is a comparison. Uh, you can note the similarities. Uh, if anything, the number of lines is the same. C isn't, C isn't that hard after all, right? Um, uh, the client code is slightly more complex, but not much more. It's still pretty readable. So you might be wondering about that switcher, though. Uh, each IO thread has its own strict of this type, and it needs to keep uh, uh, the current and previous states so that a query yield to know uh, where to return to. And of course, here is a more realistic example, because a query team to generate 10 numbers is just too much. Uh, so uh, this function well wraps the open at system call. The system call is similar to the open system call, but a uh, file descriptor to the directory where the file is located is passed. Uh, this avoids some potentially problematic path manipulations as strings and, and provide a clean way to provide, uh, to have a pre-thread references to directories, uh, all the while offering a uh, race-free file lookup within a directory. Because if you have a reference in an open directory, even if that directory is gone, that directory is still exists uh, in the system. So yeah, this function uh, works pretty much like open at uh, in the success case. But if the file could be opened correctly, it's closed automatically when the coroutine ends. The coroutine macro just casts any function pointer to one that's accepted by the coroutine function. And in this case, just the good old closed system call. And if recoverable errors happen, such as reaching uh, the maximum number of open files, or if the call system calls was interrupted, uh, the coroutine will yield, and open at uh, is called uh, after handling all their clients, which will potentially free up uh, resources uh, and be able to do that again. 
Otherwise, uh, the error code is just passed down to the client the caller function so they can probably be properly handled. Um, the error handling being wrapped in functions like this greatly reduces the amount of code in, calling, in the calling sites and reduces the possibility of mistakes in managing resources, which is always a problem in long-running programs such as web server. Uh, all the wrappers uh, used in our one will abort curating in these cases. For the file system, for the open system calls, this was required, uh, not aborting, it was required so that uh, different error messages could be presented to the user for different error cases. Yeah. So, after reading the request from the client socket, it's time to pass it. Right. So, um, the well one request pass has been written from the scratch and is quite efficient. It performs no memory copies, no allocations from the heap. Uh, the buffer obtained from the client is modified in place and pointers the possibly interesting stuff I stored in the helper structure. The actual parsing of request header values is postponed until needed, as that's sometimes not really the case. Uh, and since our only supports HP1 and 1.1, which are both uh, text protocols, uh, is a way to quickly match a bunch, a bunch of text patterns. Here's a technique I'm using. I'm not sure if I've invented this, but I've never seen this anywhere else. Uh, it essentially implements a string prefix match uh, in, in uh, switch uh, in C, and it's quite efficient, especially if compared to successive calls to string and compare, which compares the, the prefix of string. Um, to understand how it works, let's consider a 32-bit integer. Uh, integer is nothing more than a bunch of bytes, right? And you can read four bytes at once by pointing an integer to a backing store. Uh, so if in your backing store you have, say, the this, this string get space, it's back in the start of the HTTP1 request, you can see that it's easy to compare with a multibyte constant that matches that really easily. So add a few order constants, use an enum to be extra sure they'll be constants, and a macro to ensure that constants will be correctly, correct regardless of the process engineers, and a mem copy to, to call to ensure that unlike, unlike the memory uh, can be read on, on all processors. And have a quite efficient way to match a bunch of string prefixes in, in, in one fell swoop. So uh, this is generated code by the string switch versus a naive equivalent using a bunch of calls to string and compare. So in the string switch uh, version, the EAX register is filled just once, uh, then a bunch of comparisons are performed. Uh, comparing integers is pretty much about the fastest thing you can do in current generation processors, so this ends up being very, very efficient. In the naive version with calls to string and compare, memory has to be read, potentially on a byte-to-byte -byte basis, uh, since the, the uh, string is to be compared is a small and a fast path, and these functions uh, require aligned pointers, and it has to do that every single time. So even if you have a, a generic string prefix comparison function that's very efficient, is not going to be this method. Um, some other passes will do some vectorized, vectorized trickery uh, to achieve better performance than this, but they're, they're very unmaintainable. Um, so that's what parsing. Uh, talk a little bit about um, the templating engine. Uh, so I've decided to implement templating L1 since it's pretty common to want to personalize the output of uh, error messages and file listing, for instance. I could have used printf, but then it's a security disaster waiting to happen if the formatting string can be user controlled. And I enjoy writing parsers, so this is also a fun exercise. So um, the simplest yet is useful templating engine that I know of is uh, a Mustache. So uh, I've, used it, I've used it as an inspiration and implemented almost all features. Uh, it's possibly the most efficient implementation of Mustache that does not generate native code, but please don't quote me on that. Um, this is uh, implemented, uh, but uh, currently only um, Generating functions can be used. This was useful for the directory list in case where a generator function reads the information uh, one file at a time, it's being used. Both the lexer uh, and the parser are quite nice. They implemented as two independent uh, state machines. And the state itself is a pointer to a function that handles the state. I'll explain that in a minute. 
and um, the templates are compiled down to some simple purpose specific functions and during rendering, they use uh, direct threading of computer go to statements, uh, GCC extension that's supported by a few other compilers, um, which is possibly the fastest way to have an interpreter without uh, assembly. I'll, ha I'll also have a few slides about this. So here's, so this way of implementing a state machine is quite unusual, but here, so here's how to do it. The FSM for finite state machine function initializes the current state to point to a state I function and calls the state function attributing it to itself. If the state changes to any other state, it's called in the next iteration of the loop. If it returns null, the state machine ends. I did not invent this technique. I've just adapted that from uh, Golang to see after watching a talk about Rob Pike on Lexing with Go. It's a highly recommended talk. It's pretty, pretty easily found on YouTube. And have you ever heard of that go to is bad. So, meet Nestor sibling, the computed go to. So, use this, this dispatch technique. You basically build a, a table that correlates a particle upcode to a label. And this structure's variable uh, points to an array of upcodes. Then you use a special go to statement, the go to star, it has a void pointer. And this basically creates a jump restriction to that particular address. And let's say the first instruction was opcode one. It gets executed, printing instruction one to the console, advance the next instructions, and dispatch again. This is marginally better than, than, a, bit, uh, than a, a, a big switch statement in the in current generation processors. Um, another interesting tidbit about the templating mechanism is that a variable lookup in runtime is very, very efficient. The usual solution would require something like a hash table. Instead, uh, when uh, templates are processed, they're compiled to, uh, like I said, a set of specific purpose instructions. And these instructions include things like append chunk of text, append variable, beginning to iterating sequence, and things like that. And to find the variables due to lack of introspection in C, uh, the scriptor is passed through the function that breaks down uh, the source code uh, uh, for a template into those opcodes. In the highlighted example, uh, a few macros are used for convenience. Uh, these macros expand to the field uh, uh, name as a string, so it can be looked up while uh, well, uh, compiled in template. And the offset in bytes to the beginning of each structure. Uh, they are added to a stack of hash tables uh, during the compilation phase, which is destroyed after the template is successfully compiled. Uh, so this information can be looked up in runtime. And once the template is compiled, the instructions know exactly where to obtain the values of uh, each variable, giving uh, a, a pointer to a structure uh, holding the, the, the values. Uh, the same descriptor can be used for multiple uh, templates. Uh, so the free IP sample that comes with L1 is a good example of that. The same descriptor and struct are uh, used to render data in different formats, so CSV, JSON, XML, etc. And that comes straight from a database. Uh, but caching. So I've used and implemented many caches over the years, and the one in L1 ended, ended up being uh, one of the nicest one I've used so far. Unlike many caches, where uh, items are not evicted if there is no space in them. In fact, uh, the cache does not know the size of any, any of its elements. It only knows how to create and destroy items. Uh, the cache is thread safe and will uh, try really hard not to keep locks locked unnecessarily. Uh, blocking to, to lock incantation shouldn't happen. Uh, since the cache is often uh, easy within a coroutine, it yields the event loop so that uh, lock, the lock can be obtained at a later date. Um, there is a loop priority thread that, uh, in all one that kicks, kicks every now and then. And when uh, the things it does is print old, uh, unreferenced items. Uh, they're marked as, as floating if the, the thread uh, tries to, to print them uh, whenever uh, reference it, so that the last reference holder uh, will, uh, will destroy the item when the item is the referenced. Um, the main user is the file serving module, which caches information such as file metadata and the uh, play directory index. Uh, but also the dual Lua VM opcodes that are using the, the cache mechanism. 
Best API, as you can see, is pretty straightforward. And since the lifetime of entries, manageable to cache itself. So here's how cache items are declared. Uh, just embed a, a cache entry in a struct. And the cache subsystem will only touch the things uh, inside the base element. Uh, so, so here's an example straight out from the Lua module. And uh, these two functions are passed as callbacks to the cache create function. And will be called whenever items need to be created or destroyed. Uh, implementation details set up the Lua environment will show for brevity purposes. But the functions are quite short, should you, should you want to look them in, in the source code. So was it all worth it? Uh, so some people ask me what I one really means. I don't really know. A friend suggested that earlier that you should stand for the recursive kernel. L1 will annihilate Node.js. But that's very unlikely to happen. Uh, as performance is not the only metric you should look for when looking for your backend stack. But certainly it feels good to know that I, I did not do all this in vain. Um, some of you might be familiar with this page. Uh, there are a series of benchmarks performed by a company called Tekken Power, and they test the performance of some popular and some not quite popular web frameworks. And in some tests, L1 beat easily, easily beats established and mature frameworks. But by the end of the day, it's just a toy. So with that, I open for questions. And I hope we have enough time. But if we don't, it's pretty easy to find me. Leandro. Uh, <laughs> We've got very little time, so maybe one question. How fast is it? Uh, how fast is it? Well, uh, we have here, uh, it's doing 2.2 .2 million uh, uh, requests a second uh, on, uh, for JSON requests. It can do more uh, if you're not doing fancy stuff like creating JSON and serializing these things. But yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, how do you deal with the problems that have uh, often plugged uh, web servers written in C, like buffer overflows? and things of this kind, do you use any techniques to, uh, to prevent these kind of issues? OK, so I don't use any technique per se, but I do fuss the server. I do uh, some tests. I do run all the tests on the Volgrind. And with uh, address sanitizer and undefined behavior sanitizer, I use static code analyzers. I use uh, Coverity and Clang. I mean, I, I take some precautions the other way and not really uh, exploring these things in, in, in actively trying to, to, to fix these things. All right, Landro, thank you very much. Big applause. Thank you.